بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكياء واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد The history of Islam is very beautiful and there are moments in Islamic history that will bring great joy to you but then there are some moments in Islamic history that without doubt will bring great grief and sorrow. We read the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which is the centerpiece and spine of our history. And we find the most beautiful example there of a human being who was thankful to Allah in his good days and was patient in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when difficulties and calamities surrounded him. We find this example in his rightly guided successors. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu an, Umar radiyallahu an, Uthman radiyallahu an, Ali radiyallahu an. These were companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who took the responsibility of governing and maintaining the affairs of the Muslim ummah in the most upright, proper way as taught to them by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Out of the four khulafa, Umar radiyallahu an was stabbed and killed during Fajr salah. He was praying Salah, leading the companions, and there was a Persian slave, Abu Lu'lu. He took his dagger out and he stabbed Umar radiallahu an. The Ummah was devastated, but we kept going. Because Umar radiallahu an, while lying on his deathbed, he gave advice to the Ummah, to his, to his children, to his sons, to the Sahaba around him, that this wasn't the end of the journey, the journey was to continue on. And he then elected a committee. And he said to them that the Khalifa after me will be elected from this committee. And then unanimously from amongst them, they selected Uthman bin Affan an to be their leader. Uthman an was Khalifa for a period of time in which he served the Ummah day and night with everything he had in him. And then at the end, there were a group of people who made some very rude, horrible, false accusations against Uthman an, as a result of which they surrounded Medina Munawwara and refused to let Uthman an carry out his duties as a Khalifa. Uthman an had the ability to end this rebellion immediately, but he knew that it would result in a bloodbath. And that bloodbath would occur in the city of the Prophet It would involve some of the most senior and great companions. On one side, Uthman an gives in to the, these crooks and these rebels, which obviously is an insult to this position that he takes, that he holds being a Khalifa. On the other side, he allows his rebels to do what they want, kill people. That isn't acceptable either. So Uthman radiallahu an very carefully, thoughtfully puts himself in that position where he says to the companions, no one will kill anyone. And he agrees to be in house arrest. And it was during this period that these rebels one night, one day stormed the house of Uthman radiallahu an and killed him. At the death of Uthman radiallahu an, the companions unanimously appointed their next Khalifa, who was Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu an. Ali radiallahu an is taking the khilafah in a very, is taking the responsibility of khilafah in a very touchy environment. Everything's a little delicate because one of the greatest companions, the son-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not once but twice because Uthman radiallahu an had married two daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was just murdered. What happens now? How do I deal with this? Does Ali radiallahu an take a quick move and grab the people, arrest the people who killed Uthman radiallahu an and punish them and settle the case? Or does he look for every, every, every element of this corruption through his army and through the seats of, uh, of leadership and find those people one by one and then after due diligence and a proper process deal with the problem that he had? And Ali radiallahu an chose a second option because he was wise. He knew that if he punished three people today because of the murder, another hundred would get away with it. And his goal was to find out what was going on and who was involved and let the tension and the emotions calm down in the Muslim Ummah so this wouldn't lead to some sort of an internal war. But as a result of this, there were a group of companions who disagreed with Ali radiallahu an, and they wanted immediate retribution. They wanted revenge immediately. Amongst them was a companion by the name of Muawiyah radiallahu an. He was a trusted, beloved companion of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His sister was married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Umm al-Mu'mineen, Umm Habiba radiallahu anha. Muawiyah radiallahu an was one of the select companions 
that was appointed by the Prophet ﷺ to be a scribe of revelation. Whenever a verse was revealed, the Prophet ﷺ would call on a group of companions and they would come in and they would write down these verses of the Qur'an as the Prophet ﷺ would dictate them. He was very intelligent, smart, wise. Umar ﷺ appointed him in Sham to be a governor, a judge, a leader to the people. And that position of his one was maintained by Uthman radiallahu anhu. Uthman radiallahu anhu allowed him to maintain that position. Uthman, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu was related to Uthman. They were both from Banu Umayyah. And he felt that this slow process that Ali radiallahu anhu was invoking in this critical time was wrong. So here there was a difference of opinion. On one side you have Muawiyah radiallahu anhu in Sham who says that we need quick results. We want justice now. And on the other hand, you have Ali radiallahu anhu who says, I'm willing to give justice, but only after I'm sure that I'm doing it right. Things were a little rough. What Ali radiallahu anhu did in order to ensure that there would never be bloodshed in Medina Munawwara and that the companions could live in peace and those visiting the city can worship in peace and visit the Prophet of Allah in peace and there would be no noise and disturbance and warfare, no clashing of swords in the city the Prophet was lying in. May Allah's peace be on that city. May Allah protect and preserve that city. What he did was, he relocated his hub of Khilafah, where he would manage the affairs of the Muslims from Medina and takes it to a place called Kufa in Iraq. Ali radiallahu anh settles in Kufa. And this is where he's managing his Khilafah from. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided Ali radiallahu anh through some of the most difficult days Muslims have seen. And as Ali radiallahu anh was also made a martyr and when he passed away the candidate for Khilafah that was accepted by a majority of the Muslims was Hassan radiallahu anh, the older son of Ali radiallahu anh. However, in Sham there was a companion by the name of Muawiyah who also made claim to the Khilafah. So you have two people making claim to the Khilafah. You have Hassan radiallahu anh and Muawiyah radiallahu anh. Bear in mind they are both companions of the Prophet ﷺ in their own right, they're senior. From one perspective, Hassan radiallahu anh is the rightful Khalifa and this is the position of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah because of his seniority, how knowledgeable he was, how close he was to the companions, how righteous and pious he was. On the other hand, you had Muawiyah radiallahu anh who claimed that he was rightful to khali Khilafah because he had so much strength and he had such dominance and he knew that he was the one that would be able to maintain peace in the Ummah during his Khilafah. And from one perspective, Muawiyah radiallahu anh was also right. Because there is 19 slash 20 years of Khilafah, there was no internal warfare in the Ummah. Because he was able to maintain peace and control over the Ummah during his Khilafah. Now, there was a, uh, a disagreement between the two. Ultimately, as prophesied by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day during his life pointed at his young child who was barely seven, eight years old, Hassan radiallahu anh, his grandson, and said to him, one day this son of mine will serve peace to mankind. And Hassan radiallahu anh, remembering that moment, he said to Muawiyah that I, re I agree to step down from the position of Khilafah on certain conditions. You can take it. This shows us how humble Hassan radiallahu anh, was, how wise he was, how far-sighted he was. One of the conditions he said to Muawiyah radiallahu anh, was, if you die and I am still alive, then the Khilafah will come to me. And there were many other conditions that were put in place. At the end of this agreement, Hassan radiallahu anh decided to leave Kufa and return back to his birth city, al Madinah al munawwara His brother Hussein, who was also with him in Kufa, joined him and they migrated back to Medina. Hussein radiallahu anh was not pleased with the decision that his older brother took. But he accepted it because it was his older brother and Hassan radiallahu anh was very knowledgeable and pious. When they moved back to Medina Munawwara, it was at the end of the Khilafah or towards the middle of the Khilafah of Muawiyah radiallahu anh that what Muawiyah radiallahu anh did at the advice of Mughira bin Shu'ba radiallahu anh he announced that his naib, his deputy would be his son Yazid bin Muawiyah. Muawiyah radiallahu anh is still alive and he announced that after I die, the next Khalifa will be Yazid bin Muawiyah. By this point, Hassan radiallahu anh has passed away, so he's not violating his contract or agreement. And he writes a letter to the different governors through the Muslim land, telling, the, telling these governors that take allegiance 
from those that are under you, the leaders of your cities, and by extension, their followers as well, that after I die, the next Khalifa will be Yazid bin Muawiyah. Now, one thing I want to make very clear, Yazid is not a companion. He is from the generation that follows. And we don't even call him or people with such deviance uh, as our leaders or people that who we look up to, who we take inspiration from. Because just because you live in a generation does not make you from the righteous people from that generation. Now, Yazid bin Muawiyah, his... Uh, his, his deputies had spread through the land and they were all taking bay'ah on his behalf that one day when Muawiyah passes away, Yazid will become the Khalifa. Now there were some companions who made it very clear that they were not interested in giving any bay'ah to Yazid because they did not view him to be a legitimate leader. He wasn't qualified. They had concerns regarding his attitude towards religion and what kind of person he was. Amongst these people were the likes of the son of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, Abdurrahman bin Abi Bakr, amongst the people who were very bold and made it clear that they would not give any bay'ah to Yazid and not accept him as a future leader of theirs, was a son of the great companion Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu, Abdullah bin Umar, the son of Abbas radiallahu anhu, Abdullah bin Abbas, the son of Zubair bin Awam radiallahu anhu, Abdullah bin Zubair, the, ja the son of Ja'far radiallahu anhu, Abdullah bin Ja'far, and the son of Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, Hussein bin Abi Talib. Now before I move forward with the narrative, I want to take a few steps back and build a brief biography of who this great companion Hussein bin Abi Talib was. Hussein was the grandson of the Prophet He was born of the womb of the daughter of the Prophet Fatima radiallahu anha. Fatima radiallahu anha, as the Messenger of Allah referred to her as the leader of all the women of paradise. Hussein radiallahu anhu's father, who also happened to be the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his name was Ali bin Abi Talib. Ali radiallahu anhu was one of the first people to accept Islam. He grew up in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He stood by the side of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in all major battles. He was a companion that was later on selected to be the Khalifa, as we discuss uh, right now. Now, in the fourth year of Hijrah. Fatima radiallahu anha and Hussein radiallahu anha were blessed with a young, handsome, beautiful child who was named by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Al-Hussein, which means small beauty. Because he was so tiny and so small and he was so handsome and beautiful. This young man grew up in the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, playing in the lap of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, holding on to the beard of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, climbing on the shoulders of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sitting in the lap of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ was one day delivering his sermon and two young children walked into the mosque. And the Prophet ﷺ saw them stumbling and falling. And he couldn't continue giving his lecture because it was, every time, it was as if every time they fell, his heart fell down. The Prophet ﷺ loved them so dearly. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ halted the khutbah and he went to these young children, he picked them up, he came to the front of the gathering, sat down with each child sitting on his lap. And the Prophet ﷺ said that indeed your children are a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The companions, they say that we saw the Prophet ﷺ coming into the streets of Medina and Hussein would be playing with his friends and the Prophet ﷺ would run after him to chase him. We saw the Prophet ﷺ holding Hussein to his chest, kissing him on the forehead, kissing him on the lips, embracing him and saying, Oh Allah, I love this Hussein. So, oh, Ya Allah, I want you to love this Hussein too. And in one riwayah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, O oh Allah, verily love the one who loves Hussein. Ya Allah, anyone who loves Hussein, show love to those two as well. Show, show love to that person as well. In one riwayah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, as narrated by Usama bin Zayd, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took Hassan and Hussein, both of his grandsons, in his arms and said, O oh Allah, verily I love these two, so you should love them too. This hadith is narrated by Imam Bukhari. Similarly, in the hadith of Tirmidhi, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, I am from Hussein, and Hussein is from me. Allah loves the one who loves Hussein. The love the Prophet had for his grandchildren was so great. In one riwayah of Tirmidhi, the Prophet وسلم, one day held his grandson Hussein on his shoulders. 
like grandfathers do. And he was walking around. And one Sahabi saw him and he said to Hussein, Wow, look how beautiful the animal is that you're riding. It's the Prophet of Allah. I mean, think about it for a moment. When Allah decided to honor the Prophet, He gave the Prophet the Buraq to ride on. But look at the honor of Hussein that he's riding on the shoulders of the Prophet. And the Prophet laughed and said, he responded back to this companion that he's not the lucky one, I'm the lucky one. Because on my shoulders is my beautiful, handsome grandson, Hussein. As narrated by Abu Sa'id al Khudri, Imam Tirmidhi narrates the hadith that the Prophet said regarding his grandsons, Sayyida Shabab Ahl al Jannah, that they are both the leaders of the youth of paradise. In one riwayah, the Prophet ﷺ said, I oppose those who oppose you, and I am peaceful with those who are peaceful with you. Narrated by Imam Tirmidhi again. So Hussain was someone very close to the Prophet. He narrates some narrations from the Prophet. In one narration, he narrates from the Prophet that my grandfather ﷺ said, It is from the beauty of a faith of a person that they leave that which does not concern them. So the grandsons of the Prophet ﷺ also narrated. Hussain was known for being very pious and righteous. He would perform Hajj very regularly. When he was in Kufa, those years he didn't. But while he was not in Kufa, Hussain was known to have performed Hajj. Not only perform Hajj, but he would perform Hajj on foot. He would come and walk all the way from wherever he was to come and perform his Hajj. Now, coming back to where we are. Hussain is now in Medina. Muawiyah has requested that these that everyone take bay'ah and accept Yazid to be their future leader. And amongst the people that rejected was Hussain. However, Muawiyah was a righteous companion. And he did not take any step towards any of his companions. There was no assault, no imprisonment, no torture, no army sent their way, no shackles, no nothing. He was respectful to them because they were all companions. When Muawiyah was passing away in roughly the year 60 Hijri and his son Yazid was going to be the next Khalifa, Muawiyah advised Yazid and said to him, O oh Yazid, be mindful of the son of Fatima, referring to Hussein because the Ummah loves him. Be respectful to his family and be lenient with him. Yazid becomes Khalifa. One of the first things Yazid does is that he writes a letter to all of his governors and he instructs them to force those who refuse to accept him as their leader to now give bayah and that they must accept Yazid as their new leader. Yazid was not wise like his father. He did not have much respect for the companions. He was a known alcoholic. He was a womanizer. Um, he was a type of person regarding you. Imam Suyuti rahmatullahi alayhi writes in his Tariq al-Khulafa that Yazid indulged in sinful behavior. He married women along with their mothers and their daughters and their sisters. He drank alcohol and he did not perform salah. So naturally, the companions of the Prophet the Jalil al-Qadr, great companions, were, were not interested in any way at all to giving bayah. Yazid writes a letter to the governor of Medina, whose name was Walid bin Uqba, and tells him, force the bay'ah out of Hussein Now the governor sits with Hussein and he says to Hussein that it's time for you to give bay'ah to Yazid. Bay'ah again means an allegiance, political allegiance, an allegiance of obedience, that you are now his subject, he is now your leader. You must give bay'ah to him. Hussein in his heart had no intention to give bay'ah, However, in order to be careful that he would not be imprisoned or tortured, he said to this governor that give me some time and let me think about this. Let me give it some thought. And then I can tell you how I feel about it. The governor gave him some time. In the meantime, Hussein went home. He informed his family members and within a matter of a few hours, they pack their bags, leave Medina, head straight to Mecca. When he arrives in Mecca, his dear friend Abdullah bin Zubayr is a resident there. Mecca Mukarramah is free of the influence of Yazid. 
and it's a place where Hussein radiallahu an can live in peace. Now, Hussein radiallahu an is in Makkah Mukarramah. In Makkah Mukarramah, at this point, you have great companions like Ibn Abbas radiallahu an. At this point, Ibn Umar radiallahu an is there. And there are many other great companions that are also residing in Makkah Mukarramah at this time. Hussein radiallahu an, when he arrives in Makkah, the people in Kufa, who felt a void after Hassan radiallahu an left and left the affairs of the Khilafah 20 years ago to Muawiyah radiallahu an, they saw this and they noticed that Hussein refused to give bay'ah to Yazid. Therefore, there was some hope that maybe they can prompt up Hussein radiallahu an and make him their Khalifa. So they started writing letters to Hussein radiallahu an that come to Kufa and join us. Hussein radiallahu an originally didn't give much attention, but the letters started increasing and they kept coming and kept coming and they started to write promising him that, oh Hussein, um, there is no Imam over us. We have no one that rules over us. Therefore, if you come through you, Allah will guide us. Allah will unite us. Nu'man bin Bashir is a governor here who was a known companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they said that he is our governor, but we don't gather together to pray Jummah behind him. This is our level of rebellion that we don't even pray Friday behind him. We don't pray, join the Friday khutbah behind him. So if you come, we will then join you. We will pray Eid behind you. We will pray Jummah behind you. And uh, like this, they began to seek the attention of Hussein radiallahu uh, It is stated that a point came that Almost every few days there were letters coming, 50 odd letters, 60 odd letters, hundreds of letters were coming to Hussein radiallahu an. Now Hussein radiallahu an started giving this issue some more serious consideration. In particular, after the passing of Ramadan in the 60th year after Hijrah, 60th year after Hijrah, that's when Hussein radiallahu an started giving this more consideration. That maybe there is something here. Maybe we should look into Kufa. However, the other great companion living in Mecca was Abdullah bin Zubayr. He said to Hussein, forget Kufa, stay here. You and I can govern and establish a rightful Khilafah from Mecca. The people of Mecca are truthful people. They are loyal people. They are our people. These are people that are related to us. And above all of that, your grandfather was granted Nubuwa in this city. And then he explained to him that the people of, 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 of Kufa and Iraq could not be trusted because they had a history of not following through on their promises. These are people that would promise and say great things, but when it would come to the crunch, they would abandon. Farazdaq, the poet, Ibn Abbas, an, Abdullah ibn Umar, an, Abu Sa'id al Khudid, an, all of these people said the same thing that don't fall for their trap. Don't go to Kufa. Abdullah ibn Zubayr an, went even further and said if you want to be somewhere and establish a following, go to Yemen, go south. It's away from Sham and away from Iraq and these people. You will have a following there and you'll be safe and secure. We will be on your way. You know, no one will be able to come to you without going through us first because Mecca is north of Yemen. However, Hussein was a man of solid resolve. He was someone that was very thoughtful when making a decision. And when he would make a decision, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Then he would rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hussein now began to make his intention towards Kufa. But he wasn't hasty, he wasn't quick. The first step he took was he sent his cousin, Muslim bin Aqil, to Kufa. And he said to him, you will go there, scout the area, check the temperature, see how people are, what they feel like, whether they're sincere, and then write back to me. Muslim bin Aqil starts his journey with his two young sons, and he arrives in Kufa. And when he arrives in Kufa, he starts speaking to people, um, people start meeting him and in a very short period of time 12,000 representatives come and give bay'ah at his hands. That's a massive number and each of these people represent their families, their tribes. So in total there was now close to 40,000 people that were under the bay'ah of Muslim bin Aqil which as you can imagine is, uh, is a massive following. Muslim bin Aqil as his following increased, and since he was a representative of Hussein and Hussein stood in the opposition of Yazid, some people living in Kufa wrote letters to Yazid saying that you are losing control over the city. You're losing control. The governor of Kufa was a man by the name of Nu'man bin Bashir. 
who was a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wasn't as rough and as harsh as Yazid wanted him to be. He was very accommodating, very easy. You know, he, he made it clear that he wasn't intending to kill anyone because these people had not um, presented any threat to him. So Nu'aman bin Bashir, in not taking the strongest approach against Muslim bin Aqil and this massive following of his, as a result of that, Yazid became very angry and he started consulting the people immediately around him. There was one of his um, very close servants and someone who was a freed slave of his, freed slave of his, that said to Yazid that what you should do is appoint a general by the name of Ubaidullah bin Ziyad over Kufa. This man is brutal, he's lethal, doesn't care. He governs with his sword unsheathed. This is the sort of man you need to deal with Muslim bin Aqil and Hussein. Ubaidullah, Yazid, Yazid bin Muawiyah loves the idea and he appoints Ubaidullah bin Ziyad over Kufa. One morning, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad enters into Kufa. His face is covered with a corner of his turban. No one can see who he is. He has a small group of 13 to 12 people around him. When he enters into Kufa, the people of Kufa think that it's Hussein radiallahu anh, because they've never seen him before. And they come out in celebration with a warm welcoming and everyone singing and chanting and excited. And behind that veil was Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, the new governor. And he realized by seeing such a massive warm welcome that the situation in Kufa was bad. The Umayyads were losing their foothold. Yazid was not desirable there. And unless something drastic was done, this city would give allegiance to Hussein radiallahu anh, in person. And then things would be code red alert. So at this point, what... Ubaidullah bin Ziyad does. He finds his palace, he settles in, and he starts doing some ground homework. Who are the people that have given allegiance to Muslim bin Aqil? Which tribes are they from? Where do they live? He starts doing his homework on all these people. Then he orders his men to go and arrest Ja'far bin Abid, um, Muslim bin Aqil. And as they go to arrest Muslim bin Aqil, where they thought he was hiding out when they showed up there, Muslim bin Aqil wasn't there. And instead of Muslim bin Aqil, they found the person that was hosting Muslim bin Aqil and someone very close to him, his name was Hani bin Urwa. They arrested Hani and they took him in. Muslim bin Aqil realized that this was a power move by Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. So in, in return, what he did was, he gathered the people that took allegiance at his hands and said, we will march to the forts of Ubaidullah bin Ziyad and we will demand the release of Hani bin Urwa. They agreed. The day started off with Muslim bin Aqil marching with 4,000 people, 4,000 heavy. They stood outside the walls and they began to protest. One by one, the people who were advisors of Ubaidullah bin Ziyad came to these protesters and they picked them out and said, we'll bribe you, we'll give you some money, go back home. They went to their family members and said, go and call your sons. There's no need for 4,000 of them. The message is conveyed through 1,000. You don't need 4,000. Do you really want your son to die? Do you really want your husband to die? And they played this very powerful emotional game where they were able to pull people out of that army. And it went from 4,000 followers to midday being 500 followers to 300 followers to 70 followers. At the end of the night, when Muslim and Aqil was leading Aisha Salah, he started off with 30 followers. He ended with 10 followers. And as the night ended, Muslim and Aqil now had a total of zero followers. At that point, he realized that his imprisonment was definite and his death was sure. Muslim bin Aqil immediately went into hiding. He went to a lady's door. He knocked on her door. She opened the door. He said to her, I'm thirsty. Do you have anything to give to this man to drink? She called him inside and gave him something to drink. When she inquired about him, she found out that he was from the family of the Prophet He's from Ahlul Bayt. She became excited that, wow, we have someone from the Prophet's family in our home. When her son came home in the evening, she informed him, that we have someone from the Prophet's family in our house. This son of hers, unfortunately, he ratted out Muslim bin Aqil. He sent a letter to Abaydullah bin Ziyad saying that I know where Muslim bin Aqil is that you're looking for. What kind of prize can you offer? And unfortunately, once again in our history, for a matter of a few dimes and a few dirhams, an innocent life was sold out. The army of Abaydullah bin Ziyad came. They captured Muslim bin Aqil and it was in the 61st year of Hijrah. 
on the ninth of the Hijjah that Muslim bin Aqil and Hani bin Arwa were both decapitated and they were both beheaded. On the other side, in Makkah Mukarramah, Hussein radiallahu anh is getting ready to march. He's getting ready to leave Makkah. He has no idea what just happened in Kufa, that his cousin and has been beheaded and all of his supporters have, have, have ran away. and They've abandoned the cause. They've abandoned their commitment. On the 8th of the Hijjah, just one day before Muslim bin Aqil is beheaded, Hussein radiallahu anh is getting ready to leave. Many companions realized that this was a bad move and because he was a grandson of the Prophet ﷺ, they came one by one and appealed to him. Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu anh came. Abdullah bin Abbas, who was very senior and old at the time and also related to um, Hussein radiallahu anh, he came and they had a very lengthy, long conversation. Um, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anh, he asked him, ما أنت صانع? What are you planning to do? Hussein radiallahu anh responded, إني قد أجمعت المسيرة that I've gathered my belongings and I'm ready to walk, either in one or two days. فَقَالَ لَهُ إِبْنُ عَبَّاسِ إِبْنُ عَبَّاسِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ وَنْ pleaded to him and he said, فَإِنِّي أُعِيذُكَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ I ask you in the protection of Allah, please don't go, please don't go to Kufa. Those people cannot be trusted. أَخْبِرْنِي رَحِمُكَ اللَّهُ أَتَسِيرُ إِلَى قَوْمٍ قَدْ قَتَلُوا أَمِيرَهُمْ وَضَبَطُوا بِلَادَهُمْ وَنَفَوْ They've killed their leader before. You're going to go and show allegiance to these people? You're going to go and side with them? He says, because the truth is, when you do go to them, فَإِنَّهُمْ إِنَّمَا دَعُوكَ إِلَى الْحَرْبِ وَالْقِتَالِ وَلَا آمَنَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ يَغُرُّكَ That they are inviting you to war. Because as soon as you step foot in Kufa, even if they do give bayat to you, all of Yazid's armies will come in your direction. And you won't last there. They will deceive you. When the time of war comes, those people today that are sending letters to you and saying they will protect you and preserve you and stand around you, they will yukhalifuka wa yakhduluka. They will abandon you. They will stand against you. They will deceive you. They will cheat you. فَقَالَ لَهُ حُسَيْنِ إِنِّي أَسْتَخِيرُ اللَّهُ وَأَنْذُرُ مَا يَكُونَ He said, I'm doing istikhara. I'm seeking help with Allah. And let's see where this goes. Finally, Ibn Abbas comes to him again and a second time appeals that don't go, Hussein, please don't go. Hussein radiallahu anh makes it very clear that I've made my intention and I will be going. It's at that point that Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh said to him that if you are adamant that you are surely going to go, if this is what you've made your mind of, that you're going to go, then I have one request to you, which is don't take your family with you. Because I fear that your family will be killed, in, you will be killed in front of your family. فَوَاللَّهِ إِنِّي لَخَائِفْ أن تقتل كما قتل عثمان ونساؤه وولده ينظرون إليه. I fear that you will be killed like Uthman رضي الله عنه was killed while his wife and children were looking at him. What kind of life is that? But Hussein رضي الله عنه wanted to march with his family to show the people of Kufa his commitment. That I'm not coming solo while leaving my family behind, kind of one foot in, one foot out of the door. I'm coming with my family. And not only did Hussein رضي الله عنه come with his family, he came with the family of Muslim bin Aqil. Many of his supporters were with him. This was a massive group of people who were marching towards Kufa together with the intention of settling there. Hussein radiallahu anh, even though he was advised against, because he made his intention and he was a man of resolve, he left Makkah Mukarramah on the 8th of the Hijjah. He left Makkah Mukarramah on the 8th of the Hijjah. And uh, this is the opinion of Imam Tabari rahmatullahi alayhi. And he starts marching towards Kufa. While he's on the way to Kufa, Ibn Ziyad's army kind of intercepts him. And they make it very clear to him that he will not be allowed to go any more forward. And that's when reality hits Hussein and he begins to understand that the situation isn't as he had assumed. He very soon learns that Hani and Muslim and Aqil have both been beheaded and all of that support in Kufa is gone. Hussein radiallahu anh begins to have a discussion with Al-Hur bin Yazid, who was sent by Ibn Ziyad. His name was Al-Hur bin Yazid. He was the first general sent with a thousand soldiers to stop Hussein radiallahu anh. And they block off the pathway to Kufa that you're not going there anymore. Hussein radiallahu anh then turns his direction 
And he ends up going towards a place known as Karbala. This is where he settles down. And when Hussein radiallahu arrives there, he asks the people, what's the name of this place? They said, Karbala. And Hussein radiallahu an broke that word down into two and said, Karb wa bala, which means difficulty and affliction. He said, that's what we're going to get from this place. This place is not a good place. Hussein radiallahu an, he wasn't able to go back to Kufa, go, to, go back to Medina or go to Kufa because his army had surrounded him. They had stopped him. And on the 2nd of Muharram in the year 61 after Hijrah, he arrives in, in Karbala with 45 horsemen and 100 foot soldiers, as narrated by Imam Tabari rahmatullahi alayhi. From the 2nd of Muharram until the 7th of Muharram for five days, Ibn Ziyad had ordered an increase of troops to surround Hussein radiallahu anhu. It went from... Um, 1,000 soldiers to many thousands of soldiers that had come and surrounded this small family and small group of people. Now, Hur bin Yazid was someone who was soft with Hussein radiallahu anhu. And the reason was because ultimately he was the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So Ibn Ziyad noticed this. And what he did was he made it very clear that he would, that he, unless Hur would step his game up, the ruler would be changed, the, gov the, the general would be changed. And that's exactly what he did. He changed the general from Hur bin Yazid, the first um, governor, to, um, sorry, he changed the general from um, Al Hur bin Yazid, yes, from Al Hur bin Yazid to Umar bin Saad. And this Umar bin Saad now comes in. Umar bin Sa'ad, he now turns the heat up a little bit more. And he makes it more difficult on the people of Hussein radiallahu anh. He starts preventing Hussein radiallahu anh and his family members from water. He dispatches 500 people that create a wall and a barrier between the family of Hussein and the water. As narrated by Imam Tabari rahmatullahi alayhi. Hussein radiallahu anh, he tried his best to plead with these people and ask them that open up the pathway, let us go and drink our water. Why would you stop us? And he says to these people that how do you expect to ask my grandfather for water on the day of judgment when here today you aren't giving us water? But these people were adamant that they would not open the path. However, like Hur, Omar understood the respect and honor of Hussein of the Allah one. There's actually a narration quoted that there was a a conversation between one of the generals and Hussein, and that person said to Hussein that don't make me unsheathe my sword against you. And Hussein radiallahu anh said, may your mother lose you. You're thinking of unsheathing your sword against the blood of the Prophet? So at that point, that man said that had anyone else in the world said to me, may your mother lose you, I would have said the same back to them. But how can I say that to you when your mother was Fatima radiallahu anha, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu These people were doing what they were told, but their hearts were conflicted. They didn't feel right. They were reluctant of going into war, um, striking someone like Hussein of the Allah one. So when um, Yazid bin Muawiyah noticed that two of his generals were not effective, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, when he noticed that two of his generals were not effective, he then appointed the third general. And it was this man that actually um, really caused things to become escalated and caused a lot of problems. His name is... Um, Ibn Dhil Josham Ibn Dhil Josham or also commonly known as Shimr Shimr Ibn Dhil Josham Shimr arrives in front of Hussein radiallahu anh and makes it very clear that I only have one intention After either you give bay'ah to Yazid humble yourself give bay'ah to Ubaidullah bin Ziyad then you go to Sham and give bay'ah to Yazid or I behead you there's no other question. There's nothing else on the table. On the other hand, Hussein radiallahu an was proposing three possibilities. He had three petitions. He said, number one, why don't you let me go back to Medina and Mecca and I'll live there peacefully? Number two, let me go and talk with Yazid face to face in Sham. We'll figure this out like two adults. Or number three, if you don't want me to go to Medina because you're, you're fearful that I'll establish a khilafah and you don't want me to go to Yazid because you're 
intimidated for some reason, then let me just join one of the armies that are doing jihad in some part of the world, some isolated part of the world. I'll go there, live my life as a soldier with my family, and we'll give our life for the cause of Allah. But Ubaidullah bin Ziyad had very clearly instructed Shimr that either he gets on his knees or you take his head. One of two things will happen, nothing else. At this point, days had passed by and the house and tent had been surrounded. No water was going in or out. The weather was so hot, people began to become sick. These were kids, these were women. And when it became very clear that there was no pathway left but for the battlefield itself, on the 10th of Muharram, Hussein radiallahu anh was resting in his tent with his family members. And it was at this point that the soldiers began to come towards his tent. His sister Zainab came to him and woke him up and said, Hussein, the time has come. Hussein radiallahu anh's family got up. And as they were getting ready to go, Hussein radiallahu anh, you know, in one riwayah before the battle even started, he said to Muslim bin Aqil's family, why don't you guys leave and go back to Mecca? This is not your battle. They don't want you. They want me. They've already killed your father. But Muslim and Aqil's family said that what are we going to say when we go back to people that we abandon the grandson of the Prophet? With what face are we going to stand in front of them? How will we live life after that? And when those soldiers were coming towards the tent, Hussain radiallahu anh woke up his children, woke up his family members, and each of them took their armor and they walked out into the battlefield. One by one, starting from Ali al-Akbar, whose limbs were chopped into pieces, whose body was covered in blood. A man who was punctured and hit and stabbed and bruised again and again. And one by one, all of these people, they came out into the battlefield. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had tested this family. And Hussein radiallahu an was making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, it is in you who we trust. Ya Allah, in this difficult moment, you are our hope. In this time of distress, Ya Allah, you are the hope that we have. Ya Allah, you are the one who provides provisions to us in all times of our life. He's making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hussein radiallahu an then came out to the people and he called out to the people. And he said to them in a very eloquent way, that trace back my lineage and consider where I come from. Then look at yourselves. Consider, consider whether it is right for you to kill me and desiccate my body. Desecrate my body. Am I not the son of the daughter of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Am I not the nephew? Was my uncle not Hamza radiallahu an Sayyid al-Shuhada? He says, was Jafar the one who flies in paradise with two wings, not my uncle? Did you not know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said regarding me and my brother that we are the leaders of the youth of, of Jannah? And at this point, um, there were some terms that were some things that were said between both parties there were some harsh words that were said against Hussein radiallahu anh and the amazing thing is every time one of these scums said an ill thing against Hussein radiallahu anh he would make dua to Allah that dua of Allah would be accepted instantly for example there was a person by the, by the name of Abdullah bin Hawza he came to Hussein radiallahu anh and he said to Hussein radiallahu anh that do you expect hellfire meaning after we're done killing you don't you think you're going to go to the fire of hell Hussein radiallahu anh said, no, I am advancing to a merciful Allah and an intercessor who is listened to, meaning the messenger of Allah. Hussein radiallahu anh then said, oh Allah, drive him into the fire. And instantly that man's horse toppled him, he fell down, his neck snapped, and this man died right on the spot. This narration is narrated by Hafid ibn Kathir rahmatullahi alayhi in his Al-Bidayah wa Nihayah. Hussein radiallahu anh's 32 horsemen fought and they fought and fought until every one of them, one by one, was martyred. Even an infant, his name was Ali al-Azghar, he was also not spared and he was killed as well. Despite this battle, Hussein radiallahu anh did not forget his responsibility. In that battle of Karbala, Hussein radiallahu anh still prayed his salah on time. He still continued to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He... He, he stood by the side of all of his companions and fought with them until the narration say, when the final moments came for him to die, when all of the other doors had closed and it was clear that Hussein radiallahu anh would be martyred, he stepped out of the battlefield and came into his tent one last time. His son Ali ibn Hussein, 
who was sick at the time, one of the few men who did not fight in that battle because of his illness, he went to him, he embraced him, he made dua for him. Ali ibn Hussein is also known as Imam Zain al Abidin. He then went to his sister and embraced her. He went to his family members and embraced them. And then Hussein radiallahu an ultimately came out into the battlefield for the last time. The enemies surround him, but no one had the courage to strike his body. How could they strike the body that was once embraced by the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held and said that he is my flower. This man is my heart. I love him, O oh Allah. Love the one who loves him. How could a stick or a sword touch that body? And they stood at a distance surrounding him, not knowing what to do. And it was at this point that Shimr shouted, that how dare you give refuge to this sinner, this ill, foul man, attack him. The first person to lay hand against Hussein an, was a man by the name of Zurrah bin Shariq. And he attacked Hussein an. And then after that, one by one, Sinan bin Anas bin Amr al-Nakha'i attacked him and stabbed him with a spear. And they began to poke him and slash him and cut him and thrust their swords in him one by one until Hussein radiallahu anh was inflicted with 33 stab wounds and 34 blows. He breathed his last depart in this world, leaving for us an example. It was a Friday on the 10th of Muharram that Hussein radiallahu an became a martyr. And not just a martyr. An example for us all for what it means to live with honor. When Hussein was martyred, his age at the time was 56 years, 5 months and 5 days, in the year 61 Hijri. His head was beheaded, was taken off from his body, along with the heads of the others who were in his army. And they were first sent to Ubaidullah bin Ziyad and then later on to Yazid bin Muawiyah in Sham. When Yazid was presented with the head of Hussein radiallahu an, he began to poke it with his cane, he began to poke those lips. Abu Barza al-Aslami, a companion who was there, he began to cry out and say, take your cane away from that mouth because by Allah I saw the Messenger of Allah kissing those lips with his very own lips. This riwayah is quoted by Imam Tabari rahmatullahi alayhi. The list of the people who are martyred in that battle is long. And there are many companions, many of the family members, many of the tabi'oon who lost their lives standing side by side with Hussein radiallahu anh. There are many uh, narrations quoted. For example, um, it is narrated by uh, Imam Suyuti rahmatullahi alayhi in his tariq al-khulafa that it was on the day of the martyrdom of Hussein radiallahu anh, that there was a solar eclipse. Similarly, Imam um, Suyuti rahmatullahi alayhi writes in his Tariq al-Khulafa that on the day he was martyred, fresh blood was found under every stone in Bayt al-Maqdis. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was leaving signs behind for everyone. Imam Tirmidhi rahmatullahi alayhi narrates that Salama, um, she says that I came to Umm Salama radiallahu anha and she was crying and I asked her, why are you crying? She said, I just saw a dream and the Prophet ﷺ was in my dream and his beard was covered in soil and the Prophet ﷺ just told me that he had just finished witnessing the martyrdom of his grandson So when we reflect back at the story of Hussein there are some very important lessons for us to reflect over. Yes, it's one that's sad and grievous and carries a lot of pain for us all. But the first thing we need to reflect over is how Hussein radiallahu anh was a man of principle. How he believed in something. You know, it's much more valuable for a person to die for something they believe in than to live while not believing in anything at all. Not being controlled of your life. Not holding principle where nothing is meaningful to you. Hussein radiallahu anh, there was a, a mindset that he had. Yes, he differed from other companions, but what he thought he was doing was right. And then ultimately, he was courageous. He was bold. He wasn't willing to let the world dictate to him the terms of his life. Rather, he chose his pathway in life from what he had seen in the life of the Messenger of Allah, in the life of his father, other great companions. 
And I reflect over the story of Hussein. And by the way, there are so many reflections, but there's one thing I want to say as I close. That after Hussein radiallahu anh died, the people of Kufa could never forgive themselves. They always would beat themselves. They would cry. They would, you know, mourn that, oh, Hussein, oh, Hussein, we could have saved Hussein, we could have saved Hussein but we didn't save him. Each of these people, each of these people. But I reflect over us and I ask myself and I ask everyone, that what about the world around us that is being slaughtered and butchered and is in pain? What about the Muslims in Syria and Palestine, our Rohingya brothers, the forgotten humans? What about our brothers that are starving and sisters that are starving in Yemen? Just like the people of Kufa, are we just sitting by the sideline watching people die and talking about how bad we feel? Because many of those soldiers, they refused to engage saying that they felt bad, but they weren't willing to do anything. All in all, a man, an innocent man was killed. A man who, who, who wanted peace, who, did not, who cared for the Ummah. He stood against evil, he was killed. Because the people that supported him weren't willing to stand up with their own spine. They couldn't grow a spine. So as a Muslim community, where are we? Is posting on social media about people dying in two pictures about Rohingya Muslims enough? Is it okay to feel and to sit on the sidelines and watch people die? Or is there more to this story for us? Because there are so many Ubaidullah bin Ziyad and Yazid bin Muawiyah is alive today. So many of them. And they will stop at nothing. All they want is dominance and control and wealth. But with every Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, there will be a Hussein. There will be the family members of Hussein that will stand by his side, even though they're few in number, but they will give their life for the right cause. The question is, where do we stand? So enough with emotions, enough with feelings, enough with thoughts. Let's take the story of Hussein radiallahu anh on this 10th of Muharram and turn it into something meaningful, turning it, turn it into action. How about we reach out to those that are needed today and do something. Do something small, but do something. It's a million times better than doing nothing. Find an orphan online and send, send food for them. Find a hungry person, send a food pack for them. If you see someone's cold, send a blanket for them. You see someone unclothed, send garments for them. But don't sit on the sideline quiet because the story of Hussein radiallahu anh teaches us his success a great day of honor for him but a shame for the ummah that stood at the sidelines and did nothing knowing that the blood of the Prophet of Allah was being shed in Karbala the Prophet's blood it was in the veins of Hussein radiallahu anh and it was flowing in Karbala and no one was there to do anything may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and preserve us let this month of Muharram be a month of reflection let this day, the 10th of Muharram, be a day that we reflect, that we think, we connect with our history and ask ourselves, where did we go wrong? What did we do right? Because that's the beauty of our history. There's so many lessons for us within it. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers His mercy upon Hussein radiallahu anh. May Allah give us true love for Hussein radiallahu anh. Don't be shy to say you love the family of the Prophet. Don't be shy to shed a tear in their remembrance. Don't be shy to read on their lives. Just because a group of people have claimed ownership over the family of the Prophet doesn't mean you have to give up your right. As Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, as Sunni Muslims, and as Muslims, whoever we are, wherever we are, whatever denomination we come from, if we have claim to the Prophet, we have claim to his family. We love them very dearly. And just because we love them, we will remember them, we will study their lives, we will remember them, we will make dua for them. And we ask Allah to shower his endless mercy upon the family of the Prophet Sallallahu May the lessons of Karbala be embedded in us. May we learn our example from brave men and women who gave their life in our history, who stood for the truth. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala protect us, preserve us, accept from us. Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. For the benefit of those who watch this video, the primary texts that were used to put together the content for this video were the Tariq of Imam Tabari rahmatullahi alayhi, Al Bidaya wa Nihaya by Imam Ibn Kathir rahmatullahi alayhi, Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti rahmatullahi alayhi's Tariq al Khulafa, and Akbar Shah Najib Abadi's Tariq Islam, along with other resources and materials.